Hilary Byrne. Oh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by joining others in expressing my condolences to the families that are here and others who are not, um, whose loved ones died in the Grenfell fire. Uh, their pain is never, ever going to go away. And the very least we can do, and the essential first step, is to apologise for the failures. And we've heard that from both the Secretary of State and from my uh, right honourable friend who spoke from the opposition uh, front bench. Although I have to say, looking back, it is incredible that combinations of materials were allowed to be put on the outside of buildings as cladding and declared safe when no one had ever set fire to them to see what would happen. It is extraordinary, looking back on it, that this transpired. It is um, incredible that so many buildings were constructed not in accordance with the building regulations at the time, because as the Secretary of State will know, as cladding has been inspected and people have peeled stuff off and peered inside, they've gone, uh-oh, where are the fire breaks? And it is also shameful that the people responsible for this generation of jerry-built blocks thought that they could get away with. That is what we are uh, confronting. And there is no doubt at all, and I join others on both sides who've said this to the Secretary of State, that he has applied great determination and energy to the task that confronted him when he came into this post. But he will be acutely conscious that there are still thousands and thousands of leaseholders who, still, who do not know what is going to happen to their block. And with each passing day, they remain trapped, trapped in their lives, trapped in their building, which they're told is a fire risk, paying additional costs, as we have heard, and they don't know when this is going to be brought to an end. Now, the particular case that I raised with the Secretary of State in intervention is the Gateway Building uh, in the centre of Leeds. And there, three types of cladding were submitted to the Building Safety Fund for funding. And the Building Safety Fund came back and said, the render, yes, we'll pay for, but the two types of zinc cladding, zinc uh, applied to battens with various other materials, uh, um, are not eligible for funding from the Building Safety Fund, even though the specialist fire safety advisor to the managing agents and the freeholder has said, in my professional opinion, uh, that type of cladding, the zinc on battens, does not uh, comply. And that is what's led to a situation where the leaseholders are currently debating, do we spend 70, 80,000 quid and another eight months, because there's a great waiting list now, having failed to set fire to materials to see whether they were safe over a generation or two, there's a long queue with the small number of of uh, um, institutions that can do this to get your particular combination made up at height and then set fire to to see uh, what uh, happens. And I raise this because one of the considerations that those uh, constituents of mine and the managing agents are weighing up is if, well great, if actually it finds that it doesn't burn in a way that breaches the regulations, then a fire safety advisor will be able to say, well, OK, I can now issue an EWS1 certificate in respect of this building. But if it does, is it worth them doing all of this unless they're sure that if they provide incontrovertible evidence that it does burn in a way that's dangerous, that the Building Safety Fund will say, OK, we've seen the evidence, we'll now cough up to pay for its replacement. And this is a very important question. It may be a relatively small number uh, of blocks, but I think um, they deserve reassurance that if they provide the evidence that they will get a change in the Building Safety Fund's decision. Now this problem is immensely complex. The Secretary of State knows that above everybody else, as do his officials who have been working so hard, um, and also complex is the liability waterfall that he has created to try and deal with this. But 
Leaseholders sit there and they're still not sure how is this waterfall going to work. I suppose if you can extend the analogy, they hope and pray that the water will never fall on them because others higher up the chain will have uh, taken on the work uh, and the liability. Managing agents, and I have great sympathy for them, some of them are quite small. Uh, they've dealt with lift contracts and ground maintenance. They never ever thought when they came into the task of being a managing agent that they would be asked to manage a multi-million pound contract to, in effect, pick off the outside of a building uh, and rebuild it in a way that it is safe. And they are sitting there with leaseholders trying to work out, well, where's the funding going to come from from multiple sources? And this is a very, very difficult process. On the point that the um, Right Honourable Member uh, raised about buy-to-let landlords a, a little earlier, apart from what I think is the unfairness of saying to people who bought flats in good faith, you somehow uh, aren't entitled to the same protection as leaseholders, there's a practical problem. Because if you have a block, and I can think of blocks in my constituency where a goodly proportion of the flats are owned by buy-to-let landlords, if they can't come up with the money to contribute to the fixing of the problem, that's going to affect all of the leaseholders who are living in flats that they've bought in that same block because the work will never get done. So there is a pragmatic reason for ensuring that that doesn't come to pass. And I, I have to say, we, we haven't touched on in this debate the alternative approach of a building works agency, uh, rather like has happened in Australia, where a central body has taken on this complex task, but then gone after the people who should pay. Uh, I do think that, um, with hindsight, that would have been a, a better approach. And, of course, costs are rising all the time. Now, I don't know whether... One other point I wanted to make to the Secretary of State before I come on to social housing... I don't know whether he's done this, and I apologise if he has, but I did write to one of his predecessors proposing that he should uh, convene a, a standing round table, if that's not a contradiction in terms, made up of representatives of leaseholders, managing agents, fire services, fire surveyors, insurance companies, mortgage lenders, because it seems to me that would be a place, and maybe those conversations are taking place with each of those bodies individually, by the minister, his team and officials, but that, it seems to me, would be a place where these individual problems, which may be felt elsewhere, can be worked through in the aid of uh, a more speedy outcome to this. But the real test, and it's, it's a bit like the, the debt of obligation that we owe to the Grenfell families who are here today, the real test will be how soon the day will arrive when all of my constituents and everybody else's constituents in the House can finally breathe a sigh of relief, know the problem's been sorted, and can get on with the rest of their lives. Now, the, the second, and I briefly wanted to point, make the point, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the social housing crisis, because I listened with great interest to what my honourable friend from Mitchum and Morden said. In the 1980s, Leeds City Council had about 94,000 council properties. Today, it has 54,000. Now, why is that? Because there's been a big fall in the number of new houses, council houses being built across the country and the sale of council houses, which uh, means that the stock of council houses available to let to people in need is falling at the rate of about 600 a year. And there will be many, many other councils around the country with the same picture as the case. What's more, turnover is falling. People are thinking, well, I, I think I'll hang on to the council property I've got at the moment, uh, and there's ever-rising demand. In the case of, of Leeds, there are 26,500 people on the housing register, 6,500 of whom are in band A. And the maths is really terribly simple. You have a growing demand of people living in overcrowded accommodation, and all of us, I certainly have seen, an increasing number of people coming to me to tell... Uh, their Member of Parliament about the difficulty they are experiencing in overcrowded, unsuitable accommodation with medical needs and others. They are chasing a diminishing number of properties. And um, in one case, when new council houses, and Leeds is doing its best to build them, were advertised, there's a choice-based letting system in Leeds, over a thousand people applied for one new council property. One. 
Now, unless you're at the absolute top of the priority banding, you haven't got a hope in hell of getting one of those properties. And on the right to buy, and I, I too have listened with interest to the announcement that's recently been made, I have to say to the Secretary of State, in all honesty, time and time and time again, we have heard one-for-one one replacement. It has never happened. That is why the Leeds Council housing stock has gone from over 90,000 to uh, just over 50,000. And we've ended up in the absurd position where in an effort to try and increase the number of council houses for rent, um, councils, including Leeds, are buying back yeah. council houses that they originally built, but which were sold. And so they're paying twice over for one uh, property, and that does not make sense. And uh, I mean, I don't know whether the government would ever consider this, but one approach would be to say, I, I support the right to buy, but if the person who's bought the house then wants to sell it on to someone else, shouldn't the council have right of first refusal of the property back? Because we know what's happened. Many of those houses, as they've been sold and gone down the chain, as has been pointed out, have ended up in the hands of private landlords charging, as we heard a moment ago, rents that are way in excess of what uh, applied to those homes when they were council houses. And it is a, it's, a, it's an absurd system when we know there is such basic housing need. And it's not as if, and I finish on this point, it's not as if new homes have not been built. Because again, when I think of the centre of Leeds, loads of new homes have been built. They're mainly one and two bedroom flats, some of them in the blocks that are currently affected by the cladding crisis. Whereas the need in Leeds, as in many other places, as families grow, is for three and four bedroom housing. So there's been a terrible mismatch. And it's not as if there isn't the space to build. And it's not as if there haven't been the resources to build. It's been the wrong types of properties that the people who are in the greatest need are enabled to get their hands on so that they and their families can look forward to a better future. And, and frankly, the time has now come for this acute housing crisis, which is causing great suffering to people, to be addressed by the government.